Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of 1320 Stuff. So glad you tuned in with us once more. My name is Pastor D, or Daryl, um, as I'll be called. And this is my lovely co-host. Lindsay. Hey, what's up everybody? It's RJ. And so look, really quick, last episode, we talked about a number of topics and uh, things. And so we kind of talked about the Popeye's chicken sound, which we kind of <laughs> we kind of hit on COVID a little bit. And uh, bulk of the conversation kind of talked about Juneteenth and four versus 4th of July. And that brings me to ask you guys a question. Did you vote? We asked you to vote last episode. Are we going to celebrate Juneteenth? Or are we going to do the 4th of July? So we hope you guys voted. Uh, Lindsay, is is that all we talked? Yeah, I think that's all we talked about when we did get a couple questions. So last week, D or Pastor D Bishop. brought up <laughs> Prophet. Brought up that 13, um, 20 had a special meaning and that if you could guess it, there would be a prize. So inquiring minds want to know what that prize is going to be. Oh, so it's really simple. If you guess what 1320 stuff means, you will win an all expense paid trip, all inclusive to Tahiti. Um, and so whenever you guess it, whenever y'all figure it out, all expense paid trip to Tahiti, we got you. He said he wasn't the pastor on this show because clearly not the pastor he's lying. This. I think he meant Tahiti, Georgia. <laughs> Is that Tahiti in Georgia? Probably he meant not. he gonna get you a Tahitian <laughs> no, drink. No, I mean Tahiti <laughs> Village. You gonna go to Tahiti Village? Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this though, in all seriousness, real quick. I know you guys are getting to know us and trying to say like, who are these people? And so I want to ask one of the questions that we got, RJ, is how did you become, how did you come to be on the board of 100 Black Men? Oh, well, uh, so many people don't know that I grew up in the Robert Taylor Projects in Chicago. So growing up, all we saw was gangs, drugs, poverty, uh, crime, you know, murder, everything. And so I had really no positive role models, uh, male influence in my family. My father was around, my uncles, everybody's around, but... Uh, didn't really see a lot of positivity in the community around me. So I went off to college and came back. And then I got um, introduced to uh, the 100 Black Men of Chicago, which is a mentoring organization. And because I didn't really have any positive mentors growing up, uh, I wanted to kind of help change the narrative of some young guys coming up behind me. And so uh, I joined as a member, got involved, started mentoring, and uh, quickly kind of just took a leadership role and, uh, you know, been on the board now for about three years and um, we're doing some great work in Chicago. So I'm just excited to be a part of that organization and all that we can do to help these little boys and young men uh, throughout the Chicagoland area. So that's dope. That's, that's pretty much it. Uh, but also w I received a question. Uh, Wait, hold on. No, you didn't answer the question. You said, how, how did you? How did I get yeah. on the board? Well, I ran for a position. Oh, well, that's okay. important to oh, say. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> like, okay, my bad. Like, did you did you Our bribe bad. somebody? <laughs> like, how'd you do? How'd you pull it off? Okay. Yeah. No. So, uh, you know, I, there was an election. There was a board position available, and one of the guys that actually mentors me in the organization uh, said, "You know, you should run for a leadership. You know, the guys look up to you. They like you." And it happened, and uh, so we've been rocking ever since. Okay, cool, cool. That's real cool. But uh, one of the questions that we received uh, was for Lindsay, actually. Uh, she was talking about her, uh, what she doing in her career, and I think uh, she worked for Cheaters. And No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but we do know that Lindsay is. Had your uh, phones. <laughs> we, we do know that Lindsay is in leadership. Uh, so one of the questions was, how does it feel to be uh, one of the very few, I believe, uh, African-American women in leadership in your organization? Um, I think it's very interesting. I appreciate, obviously, being in leadership. I love working with people, and I think that it's important to see black women um, in roles where we're, we have a seat at the table, and I feel like very early when I became a leader in this capacity um, and kind of hiring people, I was able to see that they lacked some of the diversity that they needed to get the right candidates. Um, there were a lot of men 
and I was able to see things that they didn't necessarily see. And it wasn't on purpose. They weren't trying to keep people out. They just didn't have an eye for certain things, like things that they didn't see as normal, then they would maybe tune other things out. So I was able to kind of have that seed and I felt like it was important for me to be there. And then with the things that are ha- that's happening right now in the world, I think it's really important for my the people that are black on my team to have someone in leadership who understands what it feels like to watch an eight minute video um, of someone being murdered by the cops and then have to come to work and act like everything's okay. And so creating a space where they don't have to act like it's okay and they can come and they can talk to me and I can relate to what they're feeling and going through versus trying to fake like, yo, no, we're really sad. I'm sad for you. But like we really were able to relate on a more um, authentic level. I think that's one of the reasons that I'm here. And um, real quick, I'm sorry, I'm going long, but um, I wanted I had to do like I had to speak in one of our all hands. And I was really What's nervous. All hand? What's I'm sorry. So all hands is like an all department meeting. So okay. the entire department was there. And um, my counterpart or, or my boss is a white cop, ex-cop. Uh, and then I'm a black woman. So we both spoke. So it was very like, okay, these are two ends of the spectrum. And I was nervous that I didn't know what to say. And I think this is the hard part about being black in leadership and a woman is I didn't want to be too pro-black, right? Because I didn't want to alienate a lot of the the white or ex-cops that work for me. But then I also didn't want to disrespect the black people by watering it down too much. So I was nervous. I talked to my friend and she was like, Lindsay, if you aren't going to use your voice, then you need to give up your seat at the table. And I felt like that really hit me because it was like, well, why am I here if I don't speak for those people? They don't usually hear someone speak for them that looks like them. And so I take it very seriously. Um, So it's difficult to navigate sometimes. Sometimes I feel like, you know, I have to be sweeter. I have to be calmer. Um, But when it's time to boss up, you know, I'm ready. (laughs) Boss up. (laughs) Let me ask you this in light of everything going on. Um, and we, we touched on a lot of current events, uh, recently as a black woman in that space, is it difficult for you to maintain an how can I put it? An internal equilibrium of sorts when you are in a space where you have, aggressions microaggressions you got all this unspoken stuff you got the elephants in the room looking at the where the world is now has that increased on you it's funny i i think that black women black people this is what we do whether it's a trauma response or not this is what we've been doing like i got the code switch down packed I know when I come to work, I know how to talk for you to hear me and you to understand like, oh, she she's educated. She's no, she knows what she's talking about. And then, you know, if I'm talking to my black colleagues, I can switch that off. So I do think that that's a bit of our experience in the world, especially if you're in corporate America or, you know, you're a professional, you know how to balance the two. Um, so I would say, um, it's a little bit more now because it's pretty exhausting because this is all we're seeing. But I feel like, you know, we were made for this. This is what we've been doing. So NBA starting back up. How you, how, either one of you, how y'all feel about it? Listen, I am ready for the NBA, the baseball season. Look, I'm ready. I'm even ready for hockey, and I don't even watch <laughs> hockey. We're just ready to get back to <laughs> some level we of hockey. normalcy. Like, I'm tired of Netflix, the Fire Stick, Bad Disney stuff. Plus ain't working for me. Like, I just want to get back to some level of something. So I'm ready for the sports season. Okay, but if we go like back to normalcy, do you feel like black athletes have an obligation to the culture or to the movement? Like, do they have any obligation to stand up for black people or to speak out and use their voice in their position? Like, what do you guys think about that? I think it's a hard ask to put on someone who that's never been their desire in life and i'm not, i'm only i'm not speaking for all of them but the majority of those athletes were just trying to make it out yeah. you know or these guys just love their sport and so now they're thrust into a place where they are enjoying life enjoying their sport and now someone comes and says you have to be my spokesman that's i don't, I don't know that's a lot that's that's a lot yeah i, I mean but 
how many black athletes do we have out there? So it's not going to be for everybody, but, and to be honest, a lot of them can't even speak. Oh. Like it's, it's hard. Dang, it's dog. hard to listen to an athlete. I'm not going to even say the one who used to be, uh, be a Chicago bull, but I used to really, friend, really do wow. really listening to him do interviews. They, I'm like, <laughs> and I don't even blame them. It's like, because a lot of them go right out of high school and go right to the league. Nevertheless, I think they have a platform and I think they need to use it. They've made it out. They they got the money. They got the platform and they have to use it because if they don't, I mean, who gonna, who we going to rely on just the everyday Joe Blow to do it who ain't really got a voice or a platform? Come on now. We yeah. it's plenty of black athletes. We can find 10 or 20 of them at least to use their platform and speak up. Yeah, I agree with that. I think, well, I, I agree with both because I don't think, I think it is a lot to ask for everyone to speak up and to sacrifice. Cause like you said, like some people, that's just not their strong suit. Like just because I can play basketball don't mean I want to be a public speaker. Um, but I do feel like there, you have like a Muhammad Ali who was willing to risk everything. And to me made him the greatest as a human being, as a person. And then, you know, the athlete as well. And then you have an OJ who is like, I just was trying to get out of here. I just didn't want to have to live that kind of life. And both are valid in a way. Yeah. yeah, because I think it's hard to get out, and you do want to get. Man, no, 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 no. Let me say, let me tell you the difference. It's one thing to be like, uh, I just want to get out. It's another thing to say, don't put me in that at all. When your skin yeah. is black, I'm not black. I'm OJ. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, so okay, all right. So so what about this? Because what for the past couple? I don't know how many years it's been. You know. We've canceled Colin Kaepernick, so now we're. I'm sorry, wait. The, we canceled we, Colin. We we did. Or or they did. Yeah. Yeah, okay. They Let's canceled clear. Colin. So, what are we, what are your thoughts about that? Like, I mean, back in the NFL, like because no. he. No. I do not think he can get back in the NFL. I, I agree. think that's dead. Like, first of all, you already had a lawsuit settlement so i'm sure it said that you I, i'm sure he can't get back in and i really think that like sometimes you do sacrifice i think that it, there it was a sacrifice and it sucks um but he ain't broke Callan, Callan, <laughs> colin shouldn't be back let me tell you why because he has not played professionally what two and a half three years him going back and sucking Oh, that would be terrible for the Terrible. <laughs> it would do yeah, us a disservice. But, but, let, but let that be his decision, though. If he wants to go back and play and the team will sign him, I think he should be allowed to play. He was wrongfully put out or not re-signed anyway. So why not? If he sucked, yeah, then that's on man, him. Yeah, but he got, he got money for it. Is is And I agree with it. It's done. Him coming back does not benefit anyone other than to say, oh, we got him back in. But then when he sucks, then what? And I'm and I'm just saying he may not he may be practicing every single day, but all right. Well, he tried he tried to be a voice and he tried to take a stand by kneeling. Should he step up now and and be a a voice, take lead from an athlete's perspective, and be that voice that we need? No. Why? I don't even know if he ever was a voice. I mean, he 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 pushed the movement and he there was action behind a thought and but I don't know if I ever remember him saying anything that I was like wow that was very profound I mean I love what he did it was great uh, okay you know what this is one of those things that'll be a sound bite and it'll be like she said comedy and knew nothing but a culture let me tell you something though but you you you're on to something some people may disagree Colin was uh don't want to say I'm gonna say Colin was Rosa Parks Rosa decided randomly in a moment I'm not sitting in the back of this bus Nan another day and she did not become she did not push the movement dr king and malcolm x and these people pushed the movement colin had his place in terms of sacrificially offering up his career to be a symbol that would energize and galvanize a group but he doesn't. He has not shown the ability to be the one to push the movement forward. One reason, Colin said himself, he didn't even vote. I struggle with a cat trying to push a movement forward, and you withdraw. And it was very. And, and to and to be honest, like he seemed very stuck on 
wanting to get back into the league. So it was like, I mean, he wanted to play football and he decided like, hey, this is too much. You know, I can't stand by and let these things happen. So I'm going to take a stand just by kneeling. But he wasn't necessarily looking to be a spokesperson. Mm -hmm. He wanted to continue to play, which is why he tried to try out again recently. He wants to play. It isn't about, like, I want to be a spokesperson for the culture. He kind of pushed a movement, and then other people were supposed to come through. And I do think it kind of catapulted. I mean, it was a start. He didn't plan that. No, I don't think he thought it was going to become what it became. (laughs) Of course not, which, again, his career was wrongfully cut short, and I think he's at the point where he wants to continue to prove himself. Why shouldn't he be given that opportunity? He didn't plan it. He probably wasn't even kneeling for that. He probably just was tired. He All a, right. He had, a, he had an engine. <laughs> now you know. What? I'm gonna take me a rest while they while they sing this song. Why you? Why you down there? Uh, <laughs> black police brutality uh, against us. Uh, yeah. I mean, I just don't think he planned it, man. I think he responded out of emotion. It was what he felt in that moment, and so to ask him to one be a spokesman, I don't think that's possible. And does he come back in the league now? No. I'm, I'm like Lindsay. I mean. You sacrifice for that. Yeah. And who were the, and I hate to bring this up because I don't know their names and that, and now I'm about to be embarrassed, but the two Olympians who put their fists up, oh, they never got to, we got they never got to I'm compete I'm about to Google again. it. What's their names? I'm going to Google it while and y'all they, keep I mean, talking. And they were really shunned. And it wasn't until years later that we all were like, you know, that was a big sacrifice and a big thing that they did. They weren't necessarily looking to be the face of a movement. They just felt like I should have the ability to have a voice here. I can do what I want. Like, I should have that freedom. And I think that's what Colin Kaepernick wanted. Yeah, it was Gold Mellis, Tommy Smith, and John Carlos raised their fist yes. on the podium. So yeah. were they blackballed from not ever competing again because of that? Yeah, they, yeah. they never competed. They could never come back. It was over. Their careers were over. over. The same with Muhammad Ali. I mean, his prime years was spent out of the game. And when he came back, he would only had so much time left. Like, it was a sacrifice. Craig Hodges. Abdul Rao. Uh, what, I can't remember his last name. To play for the Blazers in the NBA. Yeah. Yeah, all, yeah they both. They all got black belt. Craig tried to get. And I, this is just a story I heard. It could be Chicago legend. Who knows? But he, he was protesting. Um, the treatment of black people and tried to get Michael Jordan and Magic Johnson to not play that first game of the playoffs the Bulls had. And they both looked at him like he was crazy. Mm. And you had to seven you had to set the last dance. Ain't nobody mentioned Craig one time. You didn't even know Craig played for the Bulls. And yeah. so it's, well, that it's brings dead. it back to whether or not black athletes should have to sacrifice because it is a huge sacrifice. Um and while we're talking about sacrifices um, what's kind of catapulted the Black Lives Matter movement currently is the death of George Floyd. And I guess we talked about it a little bit off camera, but like, what is it about George Floyd that makes this so different? And I think personally, there's a lot of things. I mean, it could be an eight minute video where we had to literally, it took eight minutes. Because we've seen a black man be, suffocated before this isn't the first time a black man couldn't breathe on camera and we had to watch it so it's like did we need nine minutes of it or what has made this the movement what like why was this the one i think one reason is it's the appalling and apparent smugness yeah of the officer on his neck yeah. His face was complete disregard for this person I'm sitting on I'm standing on top of and the pleas of the people around him. That has got to be one of the most appalling. It is this is not a police officer in threat of his There's life. This is not a police officer in the moment in the action responding right, right. to an aggression. This is a dude literally Sitting on homeboy's neck with his hand in his pocket. With his, with hand, his hand in his, in his that's, pocket. You know, that's the thing. The, the hand in the pocket. I know y'all know I'm a pastor and all that. But the hand, hand in the pocket had me cussing when I was watching that video. And not like the deacon cuss word. It had me cussing, <laughs> cussing. Because, bro, the, the arrogance yeah. and the pride 
to just disregard life. And you know how crazy you got to be to just think like God ain't going to care about this. Like nobody going to make me answer for this. So I think that's one of the things is eight minutes of watching this dude just completely disregard homeboy life. That's that's, that's insane. Because I don't even think his goal was to murder him. It was just a disregard for life that it could be lost. It's like this isn't even a concern. Yeah, y'all hear the gunshots. <laughs> we are we are filming near Chicago, and Not so at all. they Don't pop they on. popping they Don't popping they popping it. Now it's fireworks. Okay. <laughs> it's fireworks. Uh, but but I think this goes back to the point. We we're all at home on quarantine with nothing to do. For sure. So everybody's looking and watching mm-hmm. what's happening. We have all these distractions in the past and people can say, oh, I didn't see it. I didn't hear about it. But the whole world is watching, which I think gives this a whole a totally different look. You got people all in other countries protesting and standing up. And normally it's just us out, you know, boycotting, rioting, marching. Uh, but it's everybody now. Yeah, and that's that's, that's the thing. It's not just the black people. I think the white people finally get it. I don't know why it took so long, but. Well, do some they? of them, some of them get do, it. Do, uh, okay. I think that if you could look at that video, I, it took me weeks to to watch it because I just and and what's so funny? I think that like the 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 hard part about George Floyd was it almost for me personally was just another black man. Like I literally saw the video and I scrolled and I was like, here we go. And I kept scrolling. I didn't even have the decency to stop and watch it initially because I was just like another police officer on a black man. This is just going to be another one of those. And then it blew up and I couldn't believe I'm like, yo, you scrolled past this man's life being taken. And that's what so many people do all the time. So I don't even know if it's just like white people not because black lives don't matter. Yeah, well. And you know what? That's it. <laughs> it does, you still have to argue. So I'll tell you, I, I um, did an interview recently with a brother of mine, white guy named Brian in Michigan. And a member of his congregation sent a letter uh, bothered by the conversation. Because one part of the conversation, he asked me specifically, you know, Daryl, can you explain to our congregation, which is predominantly white. They are, you know, mixed church, but they're predominantly white. He said, can you explain Black Lives Matter to us? So I said, this is what I said. I said, Black Lives Matter is essentially, um, I have a younger brother, Marcus. When I was younger, I broke my wrist. My bone was sticking out my wrist. And my brother runs down the street to the house, Daryl dying, Daryl dying. He's running the street, Daryl dying, Daryl dying. (laughs) And, you know, my parents had two sons, Daryl and Marcus. At the time, one of them had a bone sticking out his wrist. They did not love Marcus less, but this one had a bone sticking out his wrist. And so they had to care for me in a different way that did not negate their other child, but took attention to the wounds of the one that was hurting. And that's how I explain, that's what Black Lives Matter. It's not no one else lives matter. It's not we matter more than, it's that we matter too. Because it does not seem that the world grasps the fact that our lives matter too. Too. And got a nice little letter uh, arguing with me about how all lives matter. And I'm like, if you don't understand after that. Baby, that is the crux of white <laughs> privilege supremacy to even argue about black lives. I mean, that's the bare minimum. I mean, mattering. We ain't even asking for. That's the threshold we at. We're just trying to matter. <laughs> you know what? You gonna argue? Can mattering? I have some more porridge? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I saw, Bizarre. I saw, I saw a meme on online, and it was a perfect analogy for. And it said, uh, you know, it's talking about why do we say Black Lives Matter? And it was a house on fire right here, and over here we got a <laughs> white lady standing in front of her house, like, why are the fire you know the fire department the fire trucks over there my house matters too and everybody's looking at her like you idiot what are you talking about your house 
it's not on your house fire. is fine. Let us pay some attention to this house over here that's burning. Let us try to save it because this is what's important right now. You just sit over there and be quiet. And I thought that was the perfect. But I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna tell you what the problem is with that. And it is not just white people. It's it's a lot of non blacks. And actually, I would dare to say some of you will be mad, but that's fine. There are some blacks that fit in this category too. It is the picture of um, anybody from Chicago. Chicago we know about Gary, Indiana. Um, anybody in the Midwest knows about Detroit and those old houses, those things. What they're really saying is that house, ha- house has no value. Even though it's on fire, who cares? Mm. Who cares that it's burning? Because this house is beautiful. This house is amazing. This house is this. That house is worth nothing. Let it burn. And I think that's my struggle a lot of times in these conversations. Um, And those of you watching, because I know many of you watching are not black, and I know you're probably like, no, that's not how I feel. Great. Email us and say, hey, that's not what you said, blah, blah, blah. This is how I feel. Articulate it. And we would definitely talk about it next episode or bring you on the show to have you share. Uh, We don't want to dominate and say this is what it is if that's not the case. I'm saying, though, as a black man in America, it feels like right. every day. I remember the uh, I every, every, day every day I got to fight, fight to prove my love. <laughs> <laughs> it's every day I got to fight to prove my value. Yeah, I mean, you can't. You don't even have to argue that. We could go to Hurricane Katrina. It's oh, black people. Lord. So we don't got to rush there. I think Those Kanye people, I think Kanye died in Hurricane Katrina and they've been having a fake person. <laughs> what is person I know. I know. It's, 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 go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, f- I mean, I feel like that's a prime example. There was no rush because these are these are ghettos anyway. These people already didn't have anything. And, and that was the language even on the coverage of it. So it it's very clear. It's very apparent how little black lives matter. And I think the reason that white people or or any other race would argue with the black lives matter statement is because they're afraid that we don't just want to matter. They're afraid that we want retribution. They're afraid that it won't stop at mattering because if we really, if, if, if we really went through history and talked about the truth, you got to pay for that. That costs something, and that's scary. It's not enough to just give us some rights. No, it, it, people need to go to jail. Like, there needs to be some bloodshed. Oh, Wait, so let's, go, let's who, ask who this going Kimo to jail, Who, who got to go to jail? <laughs> but listen, I, let me ask both of y'all this. Did you mention that, though? What do we want? What is the, the va- value? So black lives ma- matter. matter to what degree? I think all we want is, like, uh, we just want to be safe. We just want to be able to walk down the street and not worry. That's still the bare minimum. We aren't even asking for a whole lot because really we we should be talking about reparations and everybody wants to act like before, remember before COVID, universal health care was too expensive. We can afford that. We can't afford reparations because that's too expensive. Oh, we can't afford, we can't afford all of these things. COVID happened. Now you can pass out $1,200 and you can give people $600 extra. Oh, we got money. Oh, there's money. Oh, but it's it, just it's, that black lives aren't important enough to get them. Or we don't even have to have the government get it. You can find all of these companies that got their start off of the backs of slaves. Chase, you can do the research and you they can chase, they can trace back to where it started and they got their money off of the backs of slaves. Give some of that money to black people. That's making it right. It's not enough to free people. You have to make it right. Mm. But the when they say, well, what do you want? Black Lives Matter. Okay, what do you want? How can we fix this? We all looking at each other like, mm, Pastor, what's the answer? Like, It's like we don't have the answer. We don't know. We say we, we want equal rights. We want freedom. We want to be treated this way and that. But we don't know how to answer that question. We talk about reparations. What does that look like? Opportunity loans with low APR rates. Oh, we can no, figure that it is, out. That ain't what reparations look like to me. Rep- reparations look like, like give me a, a flat, flat check. check. No, <laughs> you, can't give, you can't give a flat check because we haven't been educated on how to spend money, how to make money, make money for us. It's not enough to give. You can give a bunch of people in the ghetto $350,000 and they'll be broken a month. somebody to teach it. Who? 
and give us the give us resources. Give us, us give us education. <laughs> start at at early childhood education. It's a lot of work because you didn't do it you when you were ask, supposed to. You're asking the oppressor to not only I just, the oppressor. I just want another stimulus check. Then damn, what we gonna do? But I, the, I do. Yeah, and I what did you, what, what you do with check? your stimulus check? Them uh, them shoes. <laughs> No, these <laughs> <laughs> the gold no, shoes. No, uh, listen. They were talking about a second one, and I was so hoping they was gonna give us two thousand dollars. Like I could use that, right? I got to move in a couple months. And see, that's. But I'm saying, I love him, but that's my problem with this whole idea of because they're gonna give us a bunch of money, and a chunk of us is gonna go buy new cars. Yes, cribs. because we don't understand that's wealth. Yes, we are. So what is the solution? Because they can't teach us. They not gonna teach us. And most of us don't, don't know, know, and we don't have enough unity right now to even teach ourselves how to fish. fish. So, so what's the solution? There's enough. There are enough. I think that we don't give black people enough credit. There are enough educated black people at this point. No, everybody is not going to be saved. Every every we're not going to be able to pick everyone out of the ghetto or everyone that is in poverty. Because guess what? We can keep believing that lie that white people put on TV, but white people are broke, uneducated, and ghetto too. And we believe that it's just black people, but it's white people, too. I think that we have to start at early childhood education. People need to learn about financial literacy. White people, too. We up in there teaching people about algebra. I ain't never thought about algebra again in my life. Teach people about credit. Teach people about loans. APR. Reparations look like not giving direct money to individuals, but increasing the funding and the quality of early childhood education. It's both. People need cash now because some people are underwater. And we need more than that. Loans, home loans, business loans. The stuff that they've literally been freezing us out of. We haven't been able to get home loans and we haven't been able to get business loans or we have high APR rates. So, yeah, we can get all of that. We should do. Anybody that's good at math. You good at math? Finances? No. You good at oh, math? Finances? Absolutely not. I know how to count them coins when they come to my account. <laughs> I would be interested if somebody could actually give the value of a black life in the historical context of America. What is the ultimate value of a black life? Because when you start talking reparations, that's what it's going to boil down to. It's going to be a room. And this is my problem with reparations. We do not have enough of us in leadership which means reparations is going to be determined by a room full of non-black people, probably white men, probably, probably older white men, determining the value of our lives. That's my struggle. And when you look at the world today, when it comes down to the street level, you still have white men with badges and guns that determine in a moment the value of a black life. And that is what I think, for those of you watching, that's where the frustration comes for many African-Americans. And this is not a let's rehash and argue. And for, it's, this is hopefully to help those of you understand how, how most black people feel on a day, especially in our generation, our, our age. It is this, does our life matter? So when we say black lives matter, it's to say, come on, people, yeah, we matter too. Yeah. Totally agree. They really totally yep. agree. That's that's that's, all, that's, that's all you, you just on Yep. <laughs> <laughs> totally agree. Totally agree. Well, we can't wait for your final thoughts. Absolutely. I think that I, I think overall, I think if we go back to like what happened with George Floyd and and the fact that that kind of catapulted this change, it feels like a different. It feels different to me. We've seen people die before. We've marched before, and I think you know, and even the protests. I, I mean, in the in the riots. I think that at some point we saw what our action could do. And so I, I, will we be here again? Will this happen again? Possibly. But I also think we'll remember that we do have the power to get some change, that mobilizing, going out there, tearing stuff up sometimes, it does get change. Those officers were arrested faster than any officers have been arrested in killing a civilian. But yet Breonna Taylor's officers are still kicking it. Yes, and we that's a that's another episode, and we could talk about that for sure. But I do think that th it, it, there is a shift and there is a change, and it is going to take us remembering, continuing to fight, continuing to push forward. But 
I mean, what's the other option? I don't think there is one. No. Thank you, guys. Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is RJ. We want to thank you again for tuning in to this episode of 1320 Stuff. Listen, we've talked about quite a bit this episode, but we primarily focused on Black Lives Matter. And we're at a point uh, in today's society that it's sad that we have to emphasize that Black Lives Matter because it's apparent that all li- all other lives matter to everybody else. And so we're here to put a focus on Black Lives, letting you know that we will no longer stand for uh, the killings and the abuse and the wrongful convictions of black Americans. And so it's really sad in today's society that I have to drive down the street in fear uh, when I see a police officer wondering if I'm going to get stopped or pulled over or if I'm going to lose my life today. And that's not a good feeling. When George Floyd died, I sat numb in my bedroom and I just cried and I cried and I couldn't stop the tears. And I've never felt like that at the death of somebody that I didn't even know because it really hit home for me because that could have been me. And so we are going to continue to march and protest and do whatever we can to bring light to the injustices of all black people. With that being said, we want to thank you again for tuning in to 1320 Stuff. We want you to email us, follow us on social media, subscribe and tune in for our next episode. Peace. Sandra Bland, George Floyd, Elijah McClain, Brianna Taylor, Tamir Rice, Botham Jean, Stephon Clark, Michael Brown, David McAfee, Pearly Golden, Sean Reed, Stephen Taylor, Natasha McKenna, Oscar Grant, Philando Castile, Arian McCree, Darius Tarver, Gregory Hill, Brandon Webb, Corin Gaines, Tony McDade, Yassin Muhammad, Fanaf Berry, Terrence Franklin, Miles Hall, William Green, Samuel Mallard, Brianna Taylor.